All right. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. As James said, I'm Denai Mataksa. I'm a PhD candidate in computer science here at Stanford, and I'm going to be presenting some of the work that I've done during my PhD, studying bias and representation in sociotechnical systems. So as an introduction, I'd like to get started by telling you a bit about how I arrived at this topic of study. The computer science department at Brown University, where I earned my undergraduate degrees, has a tradition of giving each course a fun theme every year. This was generally a really popular move with students, and uh, there were pop culture topics like television shows or comics. I really enjoyed most of these themes myself, but I also found that some of them were a little bit intense. So for instance, this one that had a James Bond theme, although honestly that's kind of clever for a security class, uh, or this one modeled after Star Trek, or especially this one, this was a very intense Matrix theme. Wait, it gets worse. Uh, I hope you can see that animation. It actually ran in the background of the website at all times. So these were all real course websites while I was at Brown. And it's not that I had any particular issue with the Matrix or with Star Trek, but it was that despite the fun environment, I had noticed many of my friends in those courses ended up dropping out of the courses or out of the major. And this seemed especially true for my women classmates. And there were also few, so few women faculty or teaching assistants. So given that context, some of those websites gave me a sort of intuitive feeling of unease, one that I knew didn't have anything to do with the actual material of the course, but it was still there. Years later, when I started my PhD, I came across a concept from psychology that helped me give language to that intuition. Ambient belonging is a term that describes the feeling of fitting in with a culture or a community that's passively elicited by the surrounding environment. It's a psychological concept that comes from a broader literature on belongingness, and that goes back to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Belongingness describes the psychological need to be accepted as a member of a group. So at the start of my PhD, I found this prior research that had examined ambient belonging in physical spaces like professors' offices. Cherian et al. found that students' sense of belonging could be negatively impacted by classroom cues. Stereotypical cues in offices and classrooms, like what books were on the table, what posters were on the wall, these could have a negative effect on potential students, in particular students from marginalized groups. Now, obviously, classrooms and offices are immersive and they reflect personal information about an instructor in a way that web pages aren't and don't. But based on that idea, I decided to design an experiment to see what effect uh, ambient belonging might have when transmitted through a user interface. So I designed two versions of the same course web page for an introductory computer science course at Stanford. The first used neutral imagery and the second stereotypical imagery. Both of these were designed and pre-tested to look appealing and engaging to students, and the content on the pages was identical. I only changed the aesthetic design. My hypothesis was that these should have different effects on potential students. More specifically, that the stereotypical interface would be detrimental to women, but not to men. So that would mean hypothetically producing results figures that look something like this. Comparing those two interfaces, the neutral one in the lighter color, stereotypical in the darker color, I expected there'd be very little difference in the two bars for men, that's the pair on the left, who are, you know, pretty comparable height, but that for women, that's the pair on the right, that the stereotypical interface would have a negative impact. And on the y-axis here is a seven-point Likert scale for each experimental measure. After interacting with one of those two websites assigned at random, I had participants answer questions on that seven point Likert scale about a range of measures, including whether they thought they would want to take the course, whether they expected they would feel comfortable in it, how well they expected they would do, but also a set of measures beyond the scope of the course, whether they felt confident in their technical abilities, uh, whether they even wanted to study computer science, and finally, whether they felt they would be judged according to gender stereotypes in the discipline. I'll also note here that rather than potentially negatively impacting a whole cohort of actual Stanford students, I ran the experiment using crowd workers of undergraduate age in the United States. And what I found was striking. So starting with these course related measures, women exposed to the stereotypical website suffered. As you can see for each measure, the rightmost uh, dark bar that corresponds to women who saw the stereotypical website is statistically significantly lower than all the others in the figure. 
So that means they reported lower intention to enroll, less sense of belonging, less anticipated success relative to all other participants. Moreover, women who saw that stereotypical website were also negatively impacted on longer term measures, the ones that ostensibly had little to do with the course. They said they were less interested in computer science as a field, less confident in their technical abilities, and they expected to be much more stereotyped in the discipline. And all of these were moderate to large effect sizes, as large as any in the prior work on ambient belonging in physical spaces. By the way, you might notice that exposed to the neutral website, if we just compare the two lighter green bars in each figure, women's and men's responses were mostly comparable without statistically significant differences. So for a field that emphasizes its pipeline problem, it's impressive to note that we don't actually see evidence here of pre-existing differences by gender. So I was able to conclude that gender bias could negatively impact people's sense of belonging through a user interface. But of course, belongingness, as we said, isn't specific to gender. A wide variety of biases can be conveyed visually and impact belonging. You can consider, for instance, the effect of an image like this one of Paul Ryan's interns when he was Speaker of the House on a young person of color who wants to enter government and really doesn't see themselves represented in that image. Or this grandiose image from the Rhodes Scholarship website and the effect that could have on a promising student of lower socioeconomic status who's never stepped foot in a place like Oxford and their sense of belonging in a community like the Rhodes Scholars. Visual cues in online systems can have unanticipated and unintended consequences on users across a range of dimensions. That project launched further work from other researchers like Rene Kizilkech at Cornell studying psychologically inclusive design. But it also launched my own research focusing on bias in socio-technical systems and its psychological effects. So what are socio-technical systems? Let's take a step back. Broadly, these are systems that shape and are shaped by users. They interface directly with the user, and in turn, they're often shaped by user behaviors. This includes, for instance, search engines and social media sites. And in my work, I close that loop by studying the system and the user. I combine building systems with behavioral science theory and methods focusing on users to address high stakes social issues in socio-technical systems. And in doing so, I'm looking to answer two main questions. The first, what kind of content do socio-technical systems produce? And the second, how does that content impact users towards building systems that do better? Now, traditionally in a software system, we're used to asking the first question. We know what it means for a system to work and we conduct tests and use monitoring to verify that it does actually function as expected. Socio-technical systems, meanwhile, because they're in a loop with users, the users are literally part of the system. It's not enough that a platform just functions. To evaluate them effectively, we also need to ask, first, what those outputs look like at scale, and second, what influence they have on users. By answering those two research questions, we can learn how to build socio-technical systems that have positive impacts on ourselves and on our communities. Now, before I give you a roadmap for the rest of this talk, let me explain why this work is so challenging. In the example we started with comparing two websites, we can see that content that's created by a single person, like a course instructor, can communicate bias and undermine belonging. But this isn't an individual scale problem. Most socio-technical systems today aren't showing us hand curated content. They provide us content that's been selected and organized algorithmically. And we rely on that algorithmic content for basic social functions like connection to family and friends, gathering information, and civic engagement. In the United States, as of 2019, over 70% of Americans used some type of social media, and a similar proportion got some of their news through social media. And as of 2012, which is unfortunately the most recent Pew data on search engine use, over 90% of online adults used search engines. That's a number we can somehow imagine is even higher now. And over two thirds of those searchers considered search engines to be fair and unbiased. But these systems do have significant biases. We've started to see concern about bias along the lines of gender, race, political affiliation, and more. Studying these systems, going beyond criticism to precisely measure the content that they produce and to quantify the impact they have on people remains a challenge. I see four key problems here two on the side of the system and two on the side of the user. First, these systems are dynamic. 
They change constantly, which can pose significant technical challenges in trying to study them. And second, their byproducts are ephemeral. A user's experience of their newsfeed or search engine results disappears without a trace after that interaction. There's no way to examine it retrospectively. Now, on the side of the user, they are embedded. These systems are in a loop with users, and users are interacting with dozens of such systems simultaneously in a single browser or on a single device throughout their daily lives. And finally, they're personal. Each user's view of the system is unique. And in fact, the impact it has can be very different from one person to another. To meet these challenges and close the loop of sociotechnical systems research, we need interdisciplinary solutions that tackle both sides of that equation. And this is what I do in my work. In this talk, I'm gonna show you what this looks like in practice, touching on four projects from my PhD. First, in the introduction, I described my work on belonging and bias in web interfaces. Next, I'm gonna talk about my most recent paper on race and gender representation in image search. Third, I'll bring in some of my work on partisanship in political search results. And I'll finally describe the project, the final project in my dissertation, building infrastructure for intervention audits. So let's move to that second project on race and gender in image search. One social issue that's received attention in various fields is visual representation, in particular, the representation of marginalized groups in media. As I showed in my study of course pages, visual cues impact belonging. In the field of advertising, prior work has shown that representing marginalized people in college brochures can make a university seem more appealing to students. The same has been found to be true for employees at a company and also for customers of a business. These kinds of cues are important for marginalized people. They indicate that an organization might be more welcoming to them. But importantly, the effects of visual representation are not restricted to those groups alone. Visual diversity signals inclusivity to everyone. Given the importance of algorithmic systems like search and my interest in visual representation, I was drawn to work on image search results. Do image search results accurately reflect real world diversity? Prior work from 2015 had identified that search results for occupations exaggerated gender stereotypes. Since then, and often in response to research findings like this one, Google has made many changes to their algorithms. But we might want to ask, are image search results still biased in their presentation of gender? Moreover, our field has often left race chronically understudied. Do image search results accurately reflect real world racial diversity? To answer these questions, I first needed to collect a ground truth data set with which to compare search results. The US Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks demographic breakdowns of several hundred common occupations, doctors, lawyers, real estate agents, and so on. So based on that BLS list, I set out to collect image search results from Google using as the query term, the names of those occupations. In my introduction, I described that process of identifying bias in hand design content. But in this case, I wanted to study the composition of hundreds of images for hundreds of queries. This is where studying algorithmic content becomes technically challenging. So to accomplish this, I built infrastructure to collect that algorithmic data. My pipeline for automatically collecting and processing image search results begins with a scraper to query Google with each of those query terms and capture the resulting top 100 images. To avoid potential personalization from repeated searches, I used a Selenium web driver with separate sessions per query. The scraper saved each image to cloud storage, where they were then automatically retrieved in the next step, data annotation. To annotate the data, I recruited crowd workers through Amazon Mechanical Turk with three workers assigned uh, at random to label each of those thousand images. I elected to use crowd workers here rather than automated image processing or machine learning because ultimately I'm interested in how other people perceive these images. For gender, crowd workers were asked to label whether each image showed a woman or not. For race, whether the image depicted a person of color or not. Now, this is obviously a reduction down to a single bit. Does this image represent a marginalized person? Yes or no? There are many potential ways to improve this strategy in the future, but I use this binary categorization because while both race and gender are spectra, in each case, there is a single dominant group that others are marginalized in relation to. And I collected up to three labels, considering the annotation to have reached consensus when two-thirds agreed. 
And finally, after eliminating occupations whose image results didn't show enough people or enough people with discernible race and gender, I settled on a final list of occupations. I made sure then that these occupations were not statistically significantly different from the full list of BLS occupations in terms of demographics. So putting that all together, what does this look like? Beginning with gender, I had a list of occupations with their real world workforce gender diversity from 0% women to 100% on the X axis here. And I could map each to a place on the Y axis reflecting the proportion of women in image search results for that occupation. The colors of these data points are arbitrary just to help you track each point when they move in a second. The diagonal line represents perfect correspondence. This is where the data points would line up if image search results were perfectly reflective of the real world. Above this line are cases where search results overrepresented women, and below where search results underrepresented women. So let's see some data. For example, receptionists are about 88% women, but Google images for receptionists were almost 100% women. On the other hand, women are 30% of CEOs, but only 11% of search results. And women are more than half of all bartenders, but only a quarter of search results for that query. Doing the same thing for race, we again have a set of occupations with their ground truth workforce demographics. And again, the diagonal dashed line would be a perfect accordance between the BLS and Google. Above is overrepresentation, and below is underrepresentation of people of color. You might note, by the way, that the axes here don't range from zero to one, but rather go up to 40%. That's because people of color are only 22% of the US workforce on average. And so there aren't records of occupations that are more than 40% POC. And again, we can map those to demographics observed in search images. So what we see here is that for most occupations, people of color are underrepresented. Take chefs, for instance. People of color are highly represented in that occupation at 37% but they're still heavily underrepresented in search. There are of course some cases like among librarians where we see that people of color are a very small fraction of librarians, but Google actually overrepresents them in search. Next, to quantify the degree of underrepresentation in both cases, I fit generalized linear models to the data predicting Google representation from BLS data. So looking at these figures visually, we can see that there's generally an underrepresentation of women and people of color relative to the workforce, even more so in the case of race than of gender. In order to test whether the model's predictions of the overall workforce average, those are the vertical dotted lines, whether that was significantly different from proportional representation, that's the diagonal line, I examined the model's predictions at that X value and found that indeed, these predictions were statistically significantly lower. So summarizing this for digestibility, we can say that for an occupation with 50% women, this model predicts that images will show 42% women. For an occupation with 22% people of color, the model predicts that images will show 16% people of color. And in both cases, these differences are statistically significant, even more strongly in the case of race than of gender. So going back to that question, do search results reflect real world diversity? In this data set, we find that no, images systematically underrepresent women and people of color relative to workforce participation rates. The process that I use to answer this first research question about the content socio-technical systems produce is called an algorithm audit. Algorithm audits are the process of providing repeated inputs and measuring outputs of an opaque system to draw inferences about its inner workings. Auditing without the algorithm part is a powerful tool that's been used in the social sciences for decades to identify discrimination in things like employers hiring practices or loaners lending practices. In the context of algorithms, we adapt it to examine whether an algorithm displays bias. So having answered that first question using an algorithm audit, in this project I also close the loop by connecting a second study answering this second question. How does biased content impact users and how can we do better? First, to do this, I selected a set of 10 occupations, five for race and five for gender, in which marginalized people are heavily underrepresented. I chose these ones as I felt they were among the most high impact examples, since women and people of color might already feel that they don't belong in those occupations. Next, I created synthetic image search results pages using the actual images that we collected in the earlier study. For each of the 10 occupations, I created three synthetic search results pages, one with images predominantly from the dominant group, one with images predominantly from the marginalized group, 
and another with equal representation. And I designed a randomized controlled study for each occupation, exposing participants in the studies to one of these three conditions at random. After that exposure, I then asked each participant questions about three measures of interest on a seven point Likert scale. First, I asked about their perception of how inclusive the occupation is. Second, about their interest in joining the occupation. And third, whether they felt they would belong or be valued in it. So what did we find? First, let me explain how to read the figures I'm about to show you. The first dimension I varied, gender, is shown here along the x-axis. So we can see how participants' perceptions of occupation inclusivity changed as the proportion of women in those synthetic search results increased. Second, each of these search results also had some distribution of racial representation. That's shown here with three different lines showing participant responses on the outcome measure as the proportion of people of color was increased. So reading this figure all together, what can we see? We find that greater representation of marginalized groups makes occupations seem more inclusive across the board. Reading all three lines from left to right across the figure, we can see that participants' expectations of inclusivity in this case generally increased the more women they were shown. And next, examining these three lines separately, we find that showing search results with greater representation of people of color also had a positive impact on inclusivity. In particular, showing medium or high levels of people of color's representation had a positive effect on perceived inclusivity relative to low levels of racial representation. And we also validate these findings statistically. We fit a linear model to this data that predicts perceived inclusivity from these two features, and both race and gender representation in the images had a positive and statistically significant impact on expectations of inclusivity. You'll also remember that this is consistent with prior literature on visual diversity, making organizations seem more inclusive. Next, let's look at results in the same format for the second measure, participants reported interest in an occupation. Here we see somewhat different results. While increasing racial representation does slightly increase interest in the field, as you can see from those stacked lines, increasing gender representation actually had a borderline negative effect on people's interest in the field. And again, fitting a model to predict interest from gender and race representation in the stimuli, we confirm this finding. So in this case, search results with more women had, if anything, a negative effect on our outcome measure. What might explain that? One possible explanation is occupational feminization. This is a set of theories in social science that describe the cultural turn that happens as women become more represented in an occupation, and the closely related idea that pay and other status markers decrease as women's representation increases. So although we might have good reason to believe that increasing women's representation in image search results is a normatively good idea, in some cases it can empirically lead to counterintuitive and even counterproductive outcomes. Now, going back to this setup, there's actually one piece missing here. So importantly, in addition to exposing participants to different conditions and collecting their responses, I also collected demographic characteristics like race and gender for each participant. While the previous two results I showed were largely consistent across participants, on issues like belonging, I hypothesized that people from marginalized groups might be affected in significantly different ways than those who aren't. So next, I'm going to show you two findings about participants' sense of belonging, specifically examining differences first by the participant's race and gender, uh, first by participant gender, and then by participant race, in addition to the stimuli. So first, let's examine sense of belonging as women's representation was increased, separating participants by gender. As you can see, women's representation in images had a significant effect on participants' belonging in the occupation, but that effect was heavily moderated by participant gender. When shown search results with very low representation of women, men were much more likely than women to say that they felt belonging. But as I increased the proportion of women in those search results, women's belonging increased while men's decreased to the point where they almost converged. So we find that women's sense of belonging improves with greater representation while men's declines. What this means is that we can actually compensate for pre-existing differences in gendered perceptions of belonging by increasing visual representation of women. What it also means though, is that increasing women's sense of belonging in this way might happen at some cost to men's sense of belonging. 
And again, fitting a linear model to the data, we see that gender in search results and participant gender both had a significant effect on sense of belonging, as did the interaction of those two. Finally, I did the same analysis for race, separating participants by whether they identified as white or people of color, and examining the effect of increasing racial representation in image search. Unlike the case of gender, however, I did not observe a significant effect of image diversity on participant sense of belonging. Racial gaps in belonging were unchanged by visual representation. Across the board, white participants reported a higher sense of belonging than people of color, and no amount of racial representation in those search results could change that. And again, we confirm this finding statistically. So to conclude, these findings confirm that visual representation and algorithmic content can change people's expectations of the world and of their place in it. But as we saw, there are also some important nuances to keep in mind. First, more isn't always better. Greater levels of marginalized people's representation can actually have deterring effects because of underlying social issues. Second, identity moderates effects. The same content might affect people from different identity groups very differently. And third, there are cases where existing inequity simply can't be addressed through some intervention. Technical fixes won't suffice for big social problems. So as I've just shown you, I use a combination of technical and behavioral science tools to answer these two questions. What content socio-technical systems produce and how that impacts users. Underlying the insight that visual representation impacts users, there's a key theoretical idea that I want to draw your attention to. Users in the experiment I just described, as well as in other previous work, aren't consuming search results by scrutinizing each result individually and thinking about what source each image came from and deciding whether to adjust their worldview accordingly. Instead, empirically, they consume the entire page of results at a glance. The whole page is essentially a single object. In my research, I've given a name to this idea. I call this search media. Search media is the combination of headlines, text, and ordering of results on a page that's experienced by users as a unified form of media. So when users think search results are largely unbiased and then they draw inferences about the real world from the mosaic of images in search, consciously or not, they're treating search results as a type of media. That positions Google in a role similar to that of a newspaper publisher, presenting users with a front page for every query. Now, for various legal and policy reasons, Google would heavily resist that characterization. But I would argue that that's what the data suggests is how users are psychologically experiencing search. In addition to potential policy implications for Google, this also has implications for how we conduct and analyze algorithm audits. Rather than focusing on only one part of the search page and weighting the top and the bottom of the page equally, we need to think about how users are actually consuming that content. For example, by considering the whole page and weighting results at the top more than ones at the bottom. This idea about search media and the algorithm audit strategy for studying it has implications in many domains outside visual diversity. For instance, another area of interest for me is politics. In the political context, one important kind of representation that matters is the representation of political perspectives and the potential for bias is along partisan lines. So in the third project I'll touch on today, I studied political partisanship in search media. In 2018, then US President Trump tweeted about Google. He made a series of claims on Twitter that of course got picked up by major news outlets around the country, alleging that Google search was biased against conservative perspectives. Amidst that contentious political context, I did an audit of political partisanship in web search. First, to find a real world data set of importance, I collected the names of every candidate running for federal office in the US 2018 midterm elections. That's every candidate running for either chamber, the House or the Senate in any state that year. To collect a data set, I built infrastructure to perform queries with those politicians' names, collecting the first page of search results. Scraping data at this scale entails several technical challenges. One risk is that Google will identify this irregular activity and block the scraper. Another is that a single machine conducting each of these 3,000 queries wouldn't actually finish in the course of one day, and I wanted to collect these scrapes daily. So to do that data collection of over 3,000 pages of search results daily, I used five scrapers instantiated using Amazon EC2 and coordinating between them, 
such that the scrapers rotated through a list of IP addresses and user agent strings to appear as though these queries were coming from a set of over 20 actual machines. I also instituted a random wait time of about a minute between queries, since rapid queries without wait time make it likely that Google will detect and block that irregular behavior. And finally, each query included a depersonalization parameter, as if we were querying in incognito mode, to prevent personalization by the history of queries. I wasn't too concerned about other forms of personalization, since prior work had shown that generic political queries like these are not heavily personalized. I then repeated that data collection every day for the six months leading up to the election for a total of over 4 million URLs. Finally, I used an established metric to label each of these URLs with a partisanship score. That's a measure from very liberal to very conservative that describes the ratio of liberals to conservatives who normally engage with that website. I did this with the goal of investigating the set of sources from which search media was being compiled. From what sources does Google create its search media for these political queries? For instance, if Google was biased against conservative news, we might expect there to be very few sources on the right side of this figure. Or if Google showed large partisan differences for Republicans and Democrats, maybe this would reflect some disparate treatment of political groups. Instead, however, what we found is that search media drew extensively from conservative sources, regardless of query. As you can see, this pattern also looked roughly the same, regardless of the affiliation of the candidate being searched for. So at least by these metrics, we can conclude that there isn't some widespread bias against conservative content in search media. In other words, algorithm auditing can also identify when there isn't evidence in support of some alleged bias. Now, you'll remember I said I collected this data daily for six months leading up to the election. I was interested in whether there were any temporal changes over the course of the election. And I did find evidence that political events affecting individual political candidates changed their search media. But rather going into those here, I'll just touch on one striking trend across the whole data set. Here we have the average partisanship of each page of search media weighting each individual search result by its order on the page. So a page of more partisan search media would be a data point higher up on this figure, whereas a more moderate page would be lower. And I looked at partisanship over the course of the election for candidates who went on to win their elections versus those who lost. As you can see, we found that search media clearly differentiate these two groups. Election winners have much more moderate search media than do losers. Now, before you get excited and quit your day job to start the next 538 election prediction service, I have to tell you something that political scientists would recognize very well. It's a well-established fact that election outcome has a very strong correlate, and that's incumbency. Incumbent candidates win upwards of 90% of the time or even more. So if we separate candidates out by incumbency, we actually find that this is the main driver of that trend. Search media differences reflect incumbency. Incumbent candidates have much more moderate search media than do challengers or those running for open seats. This finding empirically demonstrates a pattern that's been theorized in political science, that challenger candidates whose road to electoral success involves first winning a primary election where only members of their party are voting, are incentivized to take more extremely partisan positions. Whereas incumbents who are looking to win a more general election where citizens from both parties will be voting should take care to come across as more moderate. In short, our findings from this study demonstrate that algorithmic content reflects real world information and reveals insight that speaks to theory from other disciplines like political science. And overall, algorithm audits are a multi-purpose tool for studying bias in socio-technical systems. Without going into this too extensively, I wanna make a note here on algorithm auditing. As we've seen, conducting effective algorithm audits is technically challenging. What should we measure? How do we collect that data? How do we manage it at scale? And at times, it's also theoretically and ethically challenging as well. For instance, it usually involves breaking a platform's terms of service, which historically was illegal. So recently, I've gathered a team of leading algorithm audit researchers from four universities, and we've written an authoritative piece on algorithm auditing, including its history, best practices, ethics, and norms. So you can look forward to that piece in the journal Foundations and Trends in HCI later this year. As I said at the beginning of this talk, there are four key challenges to studying socio-technical systems. 
They are dynamic, ephemeral, embedded, and personalized. Research like mine closes that loop, connecting the socio and technical parts of these systems using a combination of computational and behavioral science strategies. But the overhead to doing this work, as we've seen, is significant. So for each website we want to study, we need to build new custom infrastructure, and that infrastructure only allows us to study one website at a time. And in order to control the stimuli that users see, we have to run experiments in highly controlled artificial experimental settings. So in order to enable researchers to do this work and to do it more sustainably, in addition to creating guidelines and best practices, we also need more effective tools. This need for tools brings me to the final project in my PhD, creating infrastructure for intervention audits. While there are existing tools for such research, they have significant limitations. There are many examples of one-off infrastructure for passive audits, as we've seen in this talk, and these can be really valuable, but they generally only collect data from one website at a time, new infrastructure has to be built for every new audit, and any experiments or interventions need to be run separately. Another option is panel survey data collected by private companies. Such data can be reanalyzed by researchers who don't have to collect it all from scratch, but in such logs, we can only see what websites users visited, not images, headlines, or other content consumed without visiting a new URL. And these data sources also don't allow for experiments and can be really expensive to get access to. And finally, I think some of the most promising work has been proposed recently by Mozilla, who are developing a tool to let researchers collect data and run experiments in the browsers of volunteers. This gives researchers a lot of control and allows for interventions, which is great. But using volunteers limits data collection and intervention to things that Mozilla will approve and users will tolerate on a volunteer basis. Plus, researchers can't follow up with participants through surveys or other kinds of additional data collection. So going back to those challenges, ideally what we want to do is allow researchers to collect data themselves in real time, to do this for extended periods of time, perhaps following up with the same users later, choosing exactly what data to collect from user browsing across all websites, and being able to combine this auditing with interventions on consenting participants. And that's Intervener. Intervener is the last project in my dissertation. It's a system designed to allow researchers to both passively audit and also intervene on the cross-site browsing experience for a group of consenting compensated participants. The system has three parts. The first is a front end, a Django web app. The second is a Chrome browser extension. And the third is the back end implemented with Amazon Web Services relational database. I'll explain briefly what these three parts do. The front end is user facing with an admin interface for researchers. It handles onboarding and offboarding, collects survey responses, gives users privacy controls for their data, and allows researchers to manage participants. The extension handles data collection, collecting the trail of links that participants visit online, timestamps, and also content on the page, customizable by the researcher. This could include images, headlines, links, or other content viewed by participants. The back end then combines and securely stores these two data sources where researchers can access them later for analysis. To make this a little more concrete, I'll walk you through intervener's use from the perspective first of a participant and then of a researcher. So from a participant's perspective, their experience of intervener has three parts, onboarding, participation, and offboarding. During onboarding, they are consented and they complete an onboarding survey, and then they're walked through the extension installation process. During participation, there are two phases. First, the extension passively collects data from their normal browsing to establish a baseline for each participant. And during the second optional phase, the system deploys interventions, changing their browsing experience. Finally, after their participation is over, they uninstall the extension, complete an exit survey, receive payment, and can potentially be contacted with follow-ups in the future. From the perspective of the researcher, Intervener involves development, recruitment, and management. During development, rather than build this whole infrastructure from scratch, the bar for entry is lower. Researchers just need to be able to edit the existing code to collect the specific data they're interested in and deploy their own interventions. Next, they can generate participant codes to allow users to sign up, distributing those through ads, survey panels, crowdsourcing platforms, or wherever else they're getting their participants. And finally, during the experiment in management phase, 
Researchers can do things like randomly assign participants to different experimental conditions and collect and analyze the resulting data. To make these benefits clear, let me walk you through two examples of studies that Intervenor can enable that are beyond the current state of the art. The first is in the domain of fake news and misinformation. There's been a lot of work in this space in the past few years, including an excellent recent paper that analyzes browser history logs published by Alan et al. in Science, which concludes that people visit websites with misinformation pretty infrequently. But Intervenor allows us to go further. First, in terms of exposure, what headlines do people see but not visit? Browser history logs only record sites that people do visit. In contrast, Intervenor can collect data on each page of a user's browsing and study things like selective avoidance by examining all of the links that people see but don't click on. Next, Intervenor is user-centered. In addition to log data, we might want to deploy surveys or interviews uh, to understand how people's beliefs change over time in relation to the content they consume. Unlike history logs, Intervenor has built-in capabilities for this kind of additional data collection that can help us better understand the user's experience. And finally, interventions. In addition to studying media consumption patterns as they are, Intervenor gives us the capacity to run ecologically valid experiments. For example, periodically prompting users to focus on content accuracy, which other recent work suggests is a promising strategy to counter misinformation. Following that work, I'm also gonna be reusing and extending Intervenor to study bias in online advertising. We've probably all noticed or heard at this point that marketing and branding is often heavily gendered and related concepts like whitewashing describe the way that dominant norms, what's considered attractive, professional, or marketable are also racialized and affect the way that we see race presented in media like movies and ads. Moreover, the content we see in advertising should have some psychological impact. That's kind of the whole point of advertising. So given that backdrop and the harms that I've shown you can occur from biases in gender and racial representation in algorithmic content, I'm interested in whether online ads shown to people also display such biases. Existing work has found that from the perspective of an advertiser, online advertising platforms don't have sufficient safeguards in place to prevent advertisers from racially targeting ads for things like housing and employment, though doing so is illegal. And similarly, that ads for things like STEM careers may not be shown equally to men and women. But if we wanted to study the set of all ads actual users are shown, current algorithm auditing techniques fall short. As you've seen, most algorithm audits collect data from a single website, and that data is presumed to be a good stand-in for what all users see. In this case, though, ads are shown to people across the whole web, not just one site, and they're highly personalized. So again, Intervenor improves the current state of the art. First, on exposure, Intervenor can collect all the ads people see in browser and get a full picture of the content of those ads. For instance, we can look at things like the distribution of gender and skin tone in those ads and ask whether they're representative of diversity. Second, Intervenor will deploy to a group of real users, collecting all the ads they're shown across all the websites they visit and allow us to study those repeated exposures in the context of those users' own demographics. To understand, for instance, whether people of different races or genders are shown significantly different ads or affected by ads differently. And finally, we can also experimentally change the ads that people see to causally demonstrate the effect that such ads can have on people's perceptions of this technology and of themselves. The last point I want to underscore about Intervenor is about the importance of privacy. Research practices in academia as well as industry have led to major tensions in recent years when users are unaware that they're participating in experiments or unable to opt out. Keeping that in mind, Intervenor is designed with participant privacy as a central value. This includes consenting and compensating all participants, providing those participants with controls over the data that we collect, including an interface for data redaction and incognito browsing, and securely and anonymously storing their data for a limited period of time. I plan to release a version of this tool publicly, allowing other researchers to run studies hosted in the Intervenor environment. Practices like these are necessary for making that research sustainable by creating trusting relationships with participants who we can work with again in the future. So to summarize, over the course of my PhD, I've worked on studying representation and bias in socio-technical systems, including the four projects I've talked about today. 
The first three demonstrate the impact of combining computational strategies like algorithm audits with behavioral science to identify bias in algorithmic content and its impact on users. First, I showed how psychologically inclusive versus alienating design could impact people's sense of belonging in a course. Second, that racial and gender biases do appear in algorithmic content and can have detrimental effects on people in the context of employment, and that different levels of representation can cause positive and negative psychological responses. And third, that building systems for auditing bias in algorithmic content is also a useful tool in cases where some alleged bias isn't observed, but that such content can reflect real world and theorized trends. And finally, Intervener takes this one step further, providing much needed infrastructure for researchers to be able to conduct this important work in a more accessible, scalable, and sustainable way. Sociotechnical systems and the algorithmic content they produce are going to continue growing as one of the main sources of education, professional opportunities, civic engagement, and more. So when we study it, it's vital that we consider both sides of that equation, the system and the user, and that we do so keeping in mind and in focus the experiences of marginalized users. This is the central aim of my work. By closing that loop between algorithmic content and its effects on people, we can build socio-technical systems that have positive impacts on ourselves and on our communities. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, just quickly before opening for questions, I'd like to take a moment to make a few acknowledgements. First, to my advisors who have guided and supported me so well over the last six years and made me feel valued, not just as a researcher, but also as a person. I also extend my thanks to the rest of my committee for all of their advice and guidance, starting even before my PhD, and for their patience as I finish my written dissertation this summer. And I'd also like to acknowledge my other collaborators, especially the students that I have been so lucky to work with, as well as the Interaction Design Lab, the Social Media Lab, and the Stanford HCI group. Working with all of you has been the absolute best part of the PhD for me, and I'm so grateful to know each of you. And finally, doing a PhD is certainly more than just a professional undertaking. I am so supremely grateful to the friends and family who have supported me throughout. So thank you again so much for your time and attention. I'm happy to take questions now and also feel free to contact me by email or to find me in person this coming year at Stanford during my postdoc or next year when I start as an assistant professor at Penn. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Denai. The sound of a very enthusiastic clap. I'll take one from the Q&A form just to kick us off, and then uh, folks can feel free to jump in. So our first question is just wondering whether there's any research um, basically looking at the correlation between that sense of a belonging and then uh, the impact in applying to or getting into a group or a career. So if, you know, if the sense of belonging goes from four to five on the Likert scale, uh, on the Likert scale, what impact is that going to have on their behavior or outcomes? And I appreciate there may not be an answer to this yet. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, belonging has been studied pretty extensively in psychology, and so I would point you in that direction for other research. But that, that was exactly the reason that I included measures that were you know, beyond the scope of just that course to think about whether someone said that they would want to enroll, um, but also to think about whether someone felt that they were even interested in computing at all. Because it's those changes that belongingness can make to the place that we see ourselves and the way that we imagine ourselves in the future that I think is really interesting and promising or you know, important to study. Yeah, I had a question. Um, in the first project um, where you were showing the search results, I was curious what your methods were for creating, for example, the collections of images of, you know, marginalized populations and so on, because that in itself can be a very complex and biased process. Yeah, definitely. So the process there was uh, first we took the set of actual images that we had produced um, by scraping in the first part. Uh, then we looked at the breakdown of, uh, of of marginalized people that we wanted in each of those three conditions, and we selected that set of images kind of starting from the first row of search results and continuing through. So basically, we were trying to get something as close to that first set of search results that people would see, while also including the right number of marginalized people for that, uh, for that experimental condition. And so sometimes this meant going further down on the page to find enough marginalized people to put in the search results because mm -hmm. there really weren't very many. Um, and then from there, we were randomizing in their presentation on that uh, set of search results. Mm -hmm. 
when you said the 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 number that you wanted, how did like I'm confused by like how you determined what you wanted? Yeah, yeah, those were the three conditions. Let me see, maybe it's worth uh, to pull up this slide, um, or maybe this one. Um, we were looking for the low condition to have approximately ten percent the medium or equal representation condition to have 50 50 and the high to be 90 percent marginalized people oh yeah so my question is like of the marginalized people how did you choose because you could have different you know there's different categories of marginalized people yeah yeah we were just selecting those from the order in which they appeared uh in okay. the search results that we had initially collected yeah so Got that's it. an important point though to make because um so the fact that for instance we don't see uh here is the slide I'm looking for. We don't see a difference um, in changing representation. We don't see an impact on people of color. I think in part that's because, you know, I'm talking about here as if we're talking about the representation of marginalized people. But in fact, really what we're looking at is the representation of white people and decreasing that. So that doesn't necessarily mean affirming the representation of particular marginalized people. Um, uh, the same way that we would ideally want to say, you know, let's take each individual's own uh, identity category and overrepresent that particular thing. I think that that's kind of like the next important step. In this case, we actually didn't have enough um, images of different types of marginalized people in order to be able to do that. We also couldn't be sure exactly how, you know, from some set of images for each individual participant, who they would say they identified with and who they wouldn't. But I think mm -hmm. that that's kind of the ultimate goal is to understand each person has you know, nearly infinite dimensions of their own identity. And so we'd like to be able to understand for each person what aspect of their identity is salient in that particular context and uh, how do we highlight that particular thing to sort of optimize for things like belongingness. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a great question. I have so many questions I get to choose from. Um, wondering, uh, I'll just quote it, much of your research maintains race and gender as discrete categories, which seems necessary for the algorithmic approach to measuring differences in representation in socio-technical systems. But does this, approach, does, does this approach increase homogenization that erases women and non-binary people of color and reify power differentials that lead to this underrepresentation? And can the algorithmic approach be modified to accommodate people who are non-normative, intersectional, or, or not discernible in their race and gender presentation? Yeah, that's a fantastic question and one that I appreciate very much myself. Um, these are definitely simplifying assumptions that we're making in order to sort of discretize the problem and make it approachable as a first step. As more and more of this work is being done, once those initial effects are established, I think we have a lot more leeway to sort of, first of all, to examine identity in more nuanced and more multidimensional ways, but also I think to do follow-up work that specifically focuses only on marginalized people's experiences while anchoring it to this sort of like broader literature that we've sort of started to establish, you know, about like everyone. Because unfortunately in science, you know, the understanding of who is the default person I think if you go straight into the work that only looks at marginalized people, sometimes your work gets pigeonholed as being, you know, like really very uh, not interesting to a broader population. And it's really only like for a specific subset of people who care of this kind of like identity issue. Um, so, yeah, these are limitations, I think, not only of um, the fact that much of this work hasn't been done before, but also of the need to try to pitch this work and establish it to a broader audience. And so that's something that I'm really cognizant of sort of bitter about and trying to change. Uh, a few others. Um, did you ever follow up with Brown CS about their websites? Uh, uh, that's a fantastic then, question, yeah. <laughs> wondering, because that one will be fast. Wondering, um, the, the slide about relationship between Google and conservative sources was interesting. And does this mean that Google search results are right-wing biased? <laughs> Great question. Um, the uh, first question about whether we have followed up with Brown CS, I know that they have been made aware of this work. Um, I don't know that they have made any concrete policy changes as a result. I mean, even while I was there, I was arguing on the core staffs that I was part of that like, you know, we should at least be thinking about this dimension. And I hope, knowing the students at Brown, I'm sure they are, but uh, the department as a whole hasn't really changed anything that I know of as of now. Um, and whether the uh, whether what really we're finding is that Google is biased towards conservative perspectives, um, the figure that I showed you there was uh, double counting, was looking at not the set of unique sources, but like how many times they came up. And so that's not adjusted for something like the number of political candidates from the different groups. Um, so I can't conclude that necessarily. If we look at 
I have similarly the figure, you can see this in the paper, the figure of uh, unique counts of sources. And we find roughly the same total weight on like the more left side of that figure and the right side of that figure. It's like about even in weight. I think actually what they're trying to do is to actively balance because this is something that they're aware of, which could be its own kind of bias. Like I don't condone balance as the right answer, but it's uh, I think that's what's going on. Well, I'll jump in with a, with a quick question. Um, I uh, really loved your talk overall. Uh, it was super, super great. I in your in the earlier part of your talk, you mentioned specifically looking at um, I think maybe it was even the previous slide to this, where you're looking at, at male and female distinctions here. Um, do you have a sense for the longevity of these kinds of effects? Like if you're looking, you know, if you're doing this and you suddenly see imagery that doesn't quite match what you believe, but if you know, versus having seen that kind of imagery for years. I don't know how you would measure that, but I'm, I'm curious if you have a, a, a thought there. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So there's two things there, right? One is like from a single exposure, how persistent is that effect? And we haven't measured that in this case, although I expect it shouldn't be that persistent. Um, there has been some previous work that followed up with people a few weeks later and did actually find some effects. So, you know, perhaps it's even on the scale of weeks. But the other point you make is around uh, repeated exposure. And I think that's the really important and powerful thing because we do interact with these systems so repeatedly, uh, you know, on a daily basis for decades even. Um, and so that's kind of one of the goals of building intervener is to be able to do that kind of longitudinal follow up with the same people and also to be able to record the content that they're actually seeing in a sort of ecologically valid way in their browser over the course of all of their web browsing in order to understand whether we're seeing these biases consistently across that data and whether those repeated exposures are having uh, more of an effect. We would expect they should compound, yeah. All right, I am gonna call time uh, and the committee, the NICE committee will now adjourn into private session where um, they will continue to demolish us in all of our questions. <laughs> and, uh, but we'd like to thank Denai for, for sharing their, their, their presentation with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing what you get up to at Penn. That's going to be super exciting. Thank you.